Our first story deals with a subculture of heavy metal music that some feel is sending a dangerous message to your kids. The forces of evil on the dark side of devil rock. And I want to talk tonight about the devil and demons and witches and wizards. And we just mix it up with hardcore and aggression and come out with something that we think is an original sound. Loud, fast, heavy, you know. Well, what do you got? What do you got? You're listening to Riff Worship, the podcast that attempts to answer the age-old question, what wake, what makes a riff? Why do we care about the riffs? Albums containing riffs that are also our favorite. Me am Austin Paulson, co-host of Riff Worship, that is. With me, as always, co-hosts Swindle Justin and Adams Dillon. How are y'all? Doing great. Stuck the landing with that. Uh, as as listexic as I am, you know, I had a hard time even understanding that myself. <laughs> but no, pretty good. This is a word. Pretty good. This is a word podcast, man. Uh, as we've often referred to it as. Uh, welcome back. It's now part four. Four, life. It is. <laughs> this is the four horsemen of thou, right? Thou um, four, a quest for peace. You know, this is uh, this is the Arn Anderson era. <laughs> Thou for a new hope, yeah. The final part of uh of our thou chapter, not, not quite. Uh, no, no, no. We gotta we gotta do the leak the Lucas uh, reintroduction. Like we got it. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna go back and uh, remaster and there, you, gotta, <laughs> you guys put, are gonna see you guys are gonna CG a dancing scene with me in like a pit, and it's gonna happen. You know, just me and a bunch of frog people. We're going to fucking uh, get hold of, somehow get hold of the Thou demos where Matthew was singing over Tyrant. And yeah, we're going <laughs> to review that. And then we're going to we're going to find the demo, the call no man happy till he's dead. We're going to do a whole episode about that. We're going to stretch out this content. <laughs> Pull it you out know, from the, on the cyber the- hell that it's been sitting in forever. <laughs> The the last deep dive we did, which was the cattle decapitation one, um, I really thought about attempting to dig dig and find a copy of um, their debut like seven inch that didn't even have Travis on it, and doing like doing like my own thing on that was like I'll just add this in there just for the hell of it, and just send it to Austin, just say put it out, just to <laughs> add more you know more input to it, but uh, I never. I could never find a copy for like next to nothing because I'm sure that's probably what it's worth. We will have a five. We still got a whole record to talk about, but we'll touch more on that later. You'll definitely see that come to fruition. But it's part four. Talked about Heathen, talked about Summit. To kind of round out that trilogy is Magus from 2018, Sacred Bones. This was released on August 31st, 2018. Whereas, like, Heathen is definitely more of a natural record and maybe a rejection of maybe philosophical ideas and over-contextualizing, you know, life, I guess. I don't know. This is a complete opposite, a polar opposite. And then I guess Summit is kind of a mixture, a balance of those two, which I, I found kind of interesting that... It kind of starts there and then goes and it's like, here are the, the two extremes of either ideology. But yeah, Magus yeah. is like, goes really hard on the kind of philosophical ideas, I guess. It's just like the Star Wars reference Swindle had. They started <laughs> like, out with like, they started out with like the middle fucking one. <laughs> and in, in some interviews, uh, Brian was saying that like, Summit is like an album where he talked about building a new world and Heathen and Magus were two different ways to do it. Uh, Heathen was like destroying uh, civilization kind of and starting new in nature and uh, Magus was like human driven maybe kind of through the self the ego yeah it's the self-critique record right like i think i went pretty hard on on heathen like the last episode because i was like 
don't know. Maybe I was coming from it like, yeah, shut up, nerd. Like, just, <laughs> <laughs> just live in the moment. Get weird. But I do agree with the idea of maybe, again, there's there's a balance to that. Yes, you probably want to live in the moment, just be here in the time that you have. But also, how do we get better as people? Well, you got to have some self-reflection. You got to think about the things that are going on, get better, progress as people. Uh, I don't, you know, there's definitely some extremes on this record for sure. Uh, but yeah. In the immortal words of Ice Cube, check yourself where you wreck yourself. It's <laughs> I mean, it's a self-introspective record, right? You know, call yourself out on your own bullshit, grow from it, or don't, and realize that if you don't grow from it, you're kind of a prick. Like, you know, um, stuck in your ways. You're not going to move forward. Um, you're spinning your wheels. You know, the last, if I've learned anything in the last five years of my life, it's you spend a lot of, you can spend a lot of self-reflection figuring out what's going to make you a better person and you can move forward from that and change that and accept who you were then to where you are now as a big change. And you can go, okay, look how far I've came, even if it was only a a period of time. Uh, But you could easily look at that and go, all right, I fucked up. Not going to do that again, but it's a good, hard lesson learned. It's time to move forward and be better, right? I'm not saying this is as like, you know, this album may not feel as positive as maybe that statement was, but it definitely, I could definitely get that vibe from the the lyric front on this album a lot. Dylan had, uh, in the last episode, had the first anti-capitalist rant on the show, and now he's had the first uh, self-help. Um, <laughs> I don't want to say rant. It wasn't a rant exactly. No, that's Tony Robbins over there. M- musing. Musing. Tony we'll say Robbins musing. hungry. <laughs> <laughs> With Heathen being kind of like the, the album that, you know, really cemented my love for this band. I was really excited, you know, like, all right, what's coming next? And, you know, it took a few years before we got a full length. They did release some. EPs and splits and collaborations with, you know, like the body, they had a split with Bargas and everything, but we didn't, we didn't see a full length for four whole years. Right. And I, I like going back and reading some of the articles about this particular summer uh, leading up into the release. A lot of articles were, were calling this the summer of thou. <laughs> <laughs> That the which is a very there's a summary record. It's a summary band, you know. Um, Everything's positive and happy, just like those summers back at the lake in 1977 when we were all so young and <laughs> vir- or virile, and you know, pot was there. And am I am I reciting a fucking Kid Rock lyric? Or what what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> Jesus Christ! Somebody cut this man off. But yeah, they basically called this the Summer of Thou just because of like a series of EPs that they put out in succession leading up to the record. And they all have their own vibe and sonic quality to them. They are, none of them are exactly the same. Um, They're all released on different labels that they wanted to work with. Uh, We kind of mentioned this in the first episode. We were kind of talking about like some of our favorite songs that didn't quite end up on full lengths, but they, you know, showed up on different EPs and such. But you basically had the house primordial, which was released in May of 2018, and this was released on Robotic Empire. And I Swindle actually, you you linked this in our in our kind of research doc. I didn't know that they had performed this or this kind of this idea spawned from a uh, a score that they'd done that like a like a festival for the uh, Baton Rouge Museum of Arts. Yeah, yeah, uh, I think there is like at a park in Baton Rouge like once a month uh for years they would film like not film uh show a movie in the park and there would be they said most of the time it would be like jazz bands uh doing improv scoring a movie and whoever if it was like the Sid, the arts council of baton rouge or whatever would try to get thou to do it for years and they just couldn't think of anything uh and i guess after doing stuff with the body they were like let's make a 
a noise record. So they live scored the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. God damn, what a movie. You know, basically all the electronic stuff that Andy's kind of known for doing. And then like some fucking drony or probably noise. German expression is shit. Yeah. And like that's that's I think that movie's cool as shit. We've we've done a few of those like viewings like we, we do the Halloween, you know, annual Halloween viewing stuff. We've definitely started out with some of those silent movies and stuff. So, yeah, you have that whole record, which is definitely more aligned with like, you know, their friends in the body. And I think people even thought this might even be the full length. At a certain point, like some people were like, oh, that's it. That's the one. And then they were like, I, I read some interviews or articles where Brian was kind of like reveling in it. Like, oh, yes, yeah. that's the full length. All right. <laughs> Mr. Burns and that shit. He was, he was like saying he was talking about how he was like, he wished that all the labels didn't do like a big press release explaining like that there would be three EPs and then the full length. So that like, uh, <laughs> When when the house primordial came out, people would be like, "Oh, <laughs> and then, <laughs> what?" And then a, a month fucking later, nightmare. And then a month later, fucking, uh, uh, yeah, inconsolable came out. Right. Well, it's it's funny you mentioned that thing with the labels too, and we'll, I'll get into inconsolable in a second. But uh, from what I understand, you know, this was like an idea they wanted to do, like with the EPs. And it sounded like they kind of just wanted to self-release them via Bandcamp. And then that way, all the funds generated from the EPs would be then used to, you know, make Magus, essentially. Um, But then I think over time, it was kind of like a natural progression into working with labels that they they wanted to work with. So you thus had the House Primordial on Robotic Robotic Empire, uh, Inconsolable, which Swindle mentioned, uh, was released May 31st on community records. Love the quote. I just wanted this to be the saddest thing we've had ever written. Brian said, <laughs> wanted this to be sadder than pygmy Lush's old friends released in 2011, which I guess is kind of what inspired this in, in general, they had like long sought to basically do a split with pygmy Lush. And for reasons, you know, out of anyone's control, maybe Pygmy Lush was busy or whatever. It just never came to fruition. So I think Val just kind of got tired of waiting around and we're like, we'll just do it ourselves. And they were, they were big time in them. Pygmy <laughs> Lush, known for big time in bands. <laughs> <laughs> Leading them along. Yep. Yeah, sure. Whatever you say, guys. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, then you have Rhea Sel- Sylvia, which uh, was released in July. Uh, on Death Wish Inc., of course, Jacob Bannon, Converge, all the whole nine. Um, again, another little tidbit that Swindle linked. I didn't know this was supposed to be uh, kind of Matthew Thudium, the guitar players. Like, this was material that was kind of meant for like a side project, maybe of the same name. Yeah. Uh, I think the writing for Magus had like gone kind of slow. So they maybe having the idea already to release a bunch of EPs, they just started reworking Matthew's songs. And I think also because a couple people uh, were not living in uh, Louisiana at the time. So they started working on his his stuff. Yeah. We mentioned in the last episode that Andy had moved to Oakland. And then I think at some point, Mitch also moved to California. Uh, So you just like have, a bunch of people kind of splintered off in different directions. Uh, Rhea Sylvia kind of more in line with like the grunge influence that they're known for, maybe more so like Alice in Chains and um, maybe more like the closest thing to a true thou record, but maybe just like straight forward, maybe even I, I saw him say softer and I'm like, it's still pretty. It's a still pretty. It's got a damn fucking crowbar song cover on it. So <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Pretty cool. I- I remember when these three EPs came out, because I, if I remember correctly, there may have been a press release for like everything or maybe yeah. it all like released it around the same time. And it was like, here's the full length that comes out at this point, but here's these other three things. And I remember looking into that going, Jesus Christ, what are we, what are we doing? What's going on? Everyone's <laughs> going to be so confused. Little did I know here we are, you know, six years later, that was the fucking plan. 
Yeah. Like <laughs> just, confuse everyone. <laughs> just throw all this shit at everybody within a handful of months of each other and just go, you figure it out. Which one's the full length? Yeah. Which, it, which one is it? Which one is it? And they did it. <laughs> it's, it's, fu- it's funny, too. You would think that, all right, this is the plan. We, we wrote all of this like EP material first. We're going to pump it out first, and then it'll lead up to the record. Apparently not the case. Like, this is pretty wild. Like, There's a quote from Brian that says, We started getting serious about doing a drone EP and an acoustic EP before we started working on Magus. And the plan was, let's do these EPs, get real wild with them, and then maybe we can take some of those ideas and work them into Magus. But what actually happened is that Andy just jumped into writing Magus so we ended up doing that first and then took some of the really small ideas we'd had on the full length and went bananas with it on the EPs. So it's just kind of, I mean, probably better that it happened that way anyway, instead of trying to like force it and, you know, in a different direction. But I guess maybe Andy got, you know, kind of struck with inspiration and just went ham on the record. They, they put the album on credit and then paid it <laughs> off with the EPs. I that mean, God, that's 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 the move, right? You're like, yeah. we want this thing out, record it, pay for it, do the other you're like, do the other things roughly at around the same time in the studio, put those out individually. I'm not saying like they're milking people because that's not what it was. It's definitely about, you know, getting material out to people, but it's like, huh. Like we kind of mentioned with people being off in different cities and stuff like that too. It's like it maybe took a little longer because of that. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure they would get together every so often and try to write, but, you know, I'm sure it was prolonged because, you know, this band likes to hash things out in the same room. They like to right. write together and everything like that. So I don't know. They said in um, since Andy had moved before he's in, they only like they tried to send like one riff through email and they were like, this just isn't for us. So like Andy would try to come out every couple months or something. Uh, yeah. And uh, it seems like that's kind of the same way this album was going. And uh, a different Brian quote was like, they, they pretty much thought it, it would take at the rate they were writing songs. It would take six years to <laughs> write Magus by itself because they were just writing like uh, one song every three months, essentially. Hey man, that's one song every three months. That's an EP a year, at least. You know, and but but I mean, we got to think of the grand scope of things too. Like a thou song, like one thou song, that's ten to fifteen minutes. I mean, you've got sixty minutes worth of music there in a year. That's pretty good. That's like some nineteen sixties, nineteen seventies shit. Put out another one. Hey, hey man, this 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 purse is empty that I'm holding. Put out another one. You know, but with these guys, it's like you get four. You get a a thou track once every three months. That's a lot of fucking music. It's, I mean, it's, it's meticulous. It's, you know, these guys care about, you know, how it's going to end up on the record. And, you know, I doubt they'll, you know, I I feel like you'd probably have to, everyone has to agree all, all 10 members, all 15, 25 (laughs) members of thou have to agree on, you know, a thing. Hey man, someone's got to hit the keg. The other thing too, that, uh, got mentioned in our research was that, uh, there wasn't a there wasn't a song necessarily that served as the catalyst for the rest of the record. You know, typically on a lot of releases, there's a single track that might work as the kind of overall theme or like the kind of inspires of the rest of the song. You start from like, you know, fucking free will and then you write heathen. Right. The song this right. album didn't really have that. Um they were saying that, uh, you know, usually with the full lengths, there's like a song. We start with a song that sets the tone and the rest of the songs have to loosely fit that feeling. This one didn't quite go like that. We were probably halfway through before we got that song that, at least for me, really made it click. That's inward, uh, which, you know, starts the record. And Andy basically wrote half of the record. And we weren't really sure if there were, uh, if it was where we wanted to take it when we started. We were still toying with the idea of doing this black metal inspired record. Brian had been talking about doing a black metal Magus black metal record for since before Heezen came out. They were even 
toying with the idea of making Magus like the B side of Heathen and it being just a black metal record. Yeah. Uh, so I think maybe they just like part of the reason why it took so long is they just weren't exactly sure what they wanted this album to sound exactly like. It certainly fits with Heathen, like tonally. Like, I don't think it's like super different necessarily. I do think it's maybe a little bit more like cohesive. I think it like, I, I think I've seen them mentioned a little bit in their like, you know, just the research for this is like, yeah, we kind of like trim the fat. We, we trim yeah. the fat from the record, you know, not only in length, but like, you know, there's definitely some, uh, it's kind of more straight ahead in my way like one thing that i definitely took away from this record was that well i think you should definitely enjoy heathen and magus as like one piece like you should listen to it from start to finish i think this record feels more like a like a big chunk like whereas like heathen you know it has like these kind of intermission parts yeah they feel like more like a palate cleanser they feel like all right I get to like come up for air and I really like those. And I think they work perfectly for that record, but like each song on, on Magus, like feeds like almost effortlessly into the next song. Like there's not really right. too much that like kind of feels like a stop and like, okay, take a break. All right, we go to the next one. Like everything flows pretty much from one song to the next, which I really, really fucking enjoyed. Like it, it made for a just kind of journey kind of, I don't know, really enjoyable kind of straightforward listen. I think there's a lot more parts to all the songs. Oh mm-hmm. my God. Yes. On this record. Holy uh, shit. Where like, uh, I mean, going back to the beginning of Val, they would have like a drone part go for like five minutes or something. So I'm not like saying anything bad about it, but there would be like some, uh, not some, he's in, there would be like the, beginning of the song it would start off with like the soft part and that would go for like two or three minutes and then it would be like the heavier version of the soft part for a couple minutes and then another a different riff and like maybe one more riff and the song would be over but uh all the songs on magus have you know it's six yeah. seven parts yeah, yeah. it's it's there is many 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 variations of kind of one or two riffs on a lot of songs and it's but they're different because they are literally changed it may just be a note changing it may be a drum hit changing and it morphs throughout the whole track to where it it on kind of a background listen like if you're working or doing whatever you it sounds like the same part but when you actually put in the time and do a focused listen like we're very prone to do you realize oh these are separate parts these are all different iterations or whatever it may be. Cause like there's even the, you know, even with the opening track inward, there's a lot in that song, a whole lot. Um, yeah. And that's again, not a slight. Um, this is a heathen was a very thick record. This is a extremely dense sounding record, any dense feeling record. Um, there's a lot on this record for sure. And it's, to what Austin said, it does seem like it may be more to the point uh, than Heathen was. Heathen definitely felt like a culmination of everything before it, where to me, this feels like, okay, this almost does feel like the yin and yang to Heathen, right? Like the the yin to its yang. Um, and it is a very, very like, it's challenging. A little bit. I like that. I like the fact that it's challenging uh, because there's you really have to listen, at least to my ear, to really latch on to certain parts. You're like, oh, okay, there's there's the thing. There's the the hook that's pulling me in. It's maybe not as immediate as some of the stuff on Heathen, where like you look at like into the marshlands, it's immediate almost. Like, ah, okay, there's there's that part. But this one, you've really got to sink your teeth in with it and go, oh. This is a ride. I'm in for it. Let's let's see what depths of hell I'm going into to uh, enjoy this. And um, there were some parts on here that may not sound or even be in the same style as like an injustice for all. 
but it's really dense like that record. Like everything on there is like, fucking, why are we doing this? <laughs> but in the best way possible. It, it yeah. literally is. It's just the best way possible. I think, I think there's like definitely some, you know, if this band has like their tropes, their classic things that they do that we mentioned, you know, with kind of droning on a certain part or like that repetition that the band's kind of known to do. Yep. Um, but there are definitely, it's a very, you know, there are definitely some unconventional things as far as like maybe some of those like shorter kind of transitional songs. Electronics. Um, electronics for sure. I mean, there's definitely some things that, you know, things that would likely end up on these EPs are definitely these like little ideas, these little like sorts of themes on the record. You know, everything about this seems a little bit like unconventional in a lot of ways. Like Absolutely. even the label they worked with, right. Is yep. like not typically, you know, I, I have like a very limited relationship with this label. And I think I got into this label because of that, but this is uh this album was released on sacred bones. This is their first record for the label. Um, this is a Brooklyn based indie label that was, uh, founded around like 2007 and, you know, it kind of has like a wide, in, you know, variety of different artists that are on here. I mean, uh, yeah, like, uh, you know, you'll have Val, uh, I love the band, uh, the men, which is a really great kind of like punk band. They, they do all sorts of different things, but, uh, uniform who, uh, Swindle and I have seen with Val, uh, Marissa Nadler, great singer songwriter. Um, Mort Garson, who like, you know, Swindle, definitely a big fan Plant of man. Sure. Plant man, Plant man, <laughs> even fucking John Carpenter, like JC, moves yeah. BG, BGKY, the, baby, the, the, the kid killer himself. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't take that out of context. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, there is no context to that. I know I, assault on precinct 13. Come on. It, it, that is, it, is that, the context. Dylan. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god! That, that was the movie. Yeah, that, that uh, was that movie. Is there another one? I forget. There's definitely oh, there's that a, one. There's, I think there's some of those later kind of weird '90s movies where he just like murks kid, murks a kid like not terribly long into it either. It was like very surprising seeing that for the first just, time. I was like, oh, what? All right, yeah. we're that's what we're that's what we're doing. That's right. uh, uh yeah. oh, what's the terrible. It's is it the Nicolas Cage remake of Wicker Man where he's dressed as the bear and he punches the woman? <laughs> I never saw like, that. Walks actually. into this lady's house, just right hook, just <laughs> bam, like uh-huh. same same kind of thing, you know. But I digress. Uh, bringing one thing up about this label is I, I I'm assuming that's where maybe the connection with the uh, some of the production work for the record came from, right? Conate released uh, sure. some stuff through Sacred Bones and. Yeah, Look who James, we have working on the record. Yeah, uh, James Plotkin mastered this record. Yeah, um, good fucking. I can't say enough about the production on this record. Uh, it's very clean. It's yeah. very, but it doesn't sound polished. Doesn't sound overproduced. But you, it is. This is the best production job this band has had t- to this point. Right, and that, and that's still, you know, like yes, James Plotkin mastered it, but you also still have like, oh yeah, you know, a guy this, who's been yeah. with the band forever. Absolutely, James Litton, he knows the band now. Right, and you know they've done a lot of shit at you know with James and also at uh, his studio, High Tower mm-hmm. Recording. So, again, I think we've kind of mentioned it before. I think James uh, first started with Summit, and then so he's kind of been with this band this entire trilogy, and you know, uh, recording EPs and such too, but. The production does sound uh, spectacular. Love it. Yeah, it's it's yeah. the heathen production sounded fantastic. Like there there was nothing. I had no negative qualms with that production. And I know that's like nitty gritty nerd shit. The songs are good or they're not kind of thing. But the production does help. Ultimately, we've all listened to shit that sounds terrible that we love. I know that, you know, oh, some yeah. of those some of those early like Eric Records uh, albums and some of the early hardcore stuff like you listen to that and it's like, God, these are still fucking great. But, um, something about the production on this record just lends to the album itself. Something about the production and the, the mixing and mastering is really good on this too. There's, there's, this is one of those albums you'll probably listen to and you can definitely hear the different things that weren't, you didn't hear the first couple times, right? Little definitely weird sounds and like, God, I love, 
I love when that stuff happens. Uh, I just, uh, I did a review recently where I talk about an album that did that very same thing. And it's like, God, that's, that's immediate. Like I'm listening to this album four times in a row just to hear what else is on there. And this is one of those for sure. Yeah. There's a lot of like little details kind of not necessarily buried, but yeah, you'll, you can kind of pick it out with like maybe some of like the acoustics that are layered in there yeah. or um, yeah, like certain ambient type of like part. I don't know. There's like definitely every time I've listened to it leading up to this episode, I'm like, man, what is going on? Like what? There's so many little like layers to this record as far as like the instrumentation and arrangements and like how it's mixed, how it's like just all kind of laid out and it, but it doesn't sound like a mess though, either. No. Like it all fits. Right. It all feels very in one with each other. Um, but yeah, I, I like that. I, yeah, I'm sure there was, I don't, I think James Plotkin, um, had worked, worked with, with the band before. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you Baton Rouge, you have much to answer for the cower split, Archer and the Owl, uh, the split with hell sacrifice EP. So yeah, there's definitely some things there. Uh, but it is cool that there is also that connection with the label, which yeah, as far as I understand, I think they just wanted to, you know, yeah, it would probably be very easy for like a, to do a metal label and that, oh, of course, know, sh- sure. But like, I think they wanted to maybe branch out and perhaps like reach a, like a different audience of people, perhaps like maybe get thou exposed to like people that aren't listening to perhaps like doom and sludge and everything like that. But it's, it's cool that what was the weird label that Def heaven was on for a period of time but after death wish they were on anti. Right. That, okay, maybe that's what I'm thinking of. Like, what a, you know, what a strange choice for a band like that, right? Basically, a black metal band, um, choosing to be on anti. I mean, anti is a little bit more storied, right? Like the weights and all that. But it's uh, it's an offshoot of of Epitaph Records. But like that's that's what it made me think of when you know I see the Sacred Bones kind of seal on the back of the record. It very much made me think of. Wait, who did Def Heaven sign with? Kind of thing. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, sure. Let's see what happens. And they reached a, a wider audience. What I want to know though is, can we bring Plant Man back to life and do a collab of one of that the Thou more Carson and <laughs> Thou? Yeah. Take. Uh, I want Andy to take all of the the synth tracks from like the uh, the moon landing video and uh, <laughs> fuck with it. I think that's some of the funnest shit ever. Like I have Plantasia and I'll just like, yeah. I don't want to like necessarily, uh, if I want to just chill, I'll put that on for sure. I haven't planted my seeds yet though. So who? I still haven't. It's more Garson. The, who did we the, talk to recently that was talking about that? Pelagius? Oh, the Pelagius guys. Yeah. Okay. They, yeah. They were into that shit. Uh, Sacred Bones is reissuing a different Mort Garson record. Like, uh, they just announced it this week. Really? Do you know yeah. much about it? Or uh, I think it's some occult shit, uh, <laughs> which is fine. Uh, Damn, more. I, I didn't just... know. I didn't know you got wet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm signing off. <laughs> this is this is too much. It's been a day. I'm going to go watch a little Nikki and curl up in a ball and cry. <laughs> it, I would cry too if I was watching little Nikki. Fucking Philistine. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, label, very cool. Thou, very cool. Both James, very cool. Made it for a great production. Little Nikki, cool. Uh, all right, moving ahead. Uh, <laughs> the artwork is also fantastic. And actually, everyone. <laughs> Everyone, <laughs> everyone, show I mean, your piece. Wow, fucked up, Swindle. <laughs> hold on, uh, hold nerd. On. Oh wait, I don't think he's coming back. Yeah, this is when I leave the show for good. <laughs> it just wow, <laughs> it sure is pretty. It keeps me from having wow. to make another graphic. I love that. Oh, wow. look at look at this. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do love those. Oh. I mean. Even the kind of, and I'll hopefully do this without dumping the whole fucking thing out on my desk here. But uh, yeah, that's pretty rad. Man, that's is that cool. American Beauty? <laughs> I hope not. Um, <laughs> I think. When did you guys get yours? 
uh on my birthday his swindle was gracious 2019 yeah, yeah it this was is, i think this is a pre-order I, I i can't remember if i picked this up at a record store if i actually was like oh I'll, I'll get it you know why not i've never really given the band you know a deeper listen i'll just pick this up so the story behind this is uh on march 24th of 2019 which is the day before austin's birthday we went to go see the Maybe the first Emma and Thou collab set in Nashville at Dark Matter. And oh, yeah, Dark, I, bought, Dark Matter. I bought Magus and rode home with Austin. And Austin was like, shit, I didn't have any cash, so I didn't buy the record. And I was like, well, happy birthday, Austin. This is your record now. And very nice. Uh, my ex-partner at the time had bought the record at the show. And I was like, hey, my birthday's next month. Uh, oh my God! <laughs> so give me that record that you yeah, just right. bought. <laughs> I appreciate it. I've cherished it always. It's uh, it's really cool. I think you know it's like a double album, obviously, and um, not this album. No fucking way. Yeah, it's no, uh, no. it's cool. <laughs> I liked it. Uh, great the show. Vinyl's heavy. Like, yeah, <laughs> there's so much music, and you just the you pick it up, it thuds when you set it down. <laughs> I, I, it's it's such a cool packaging. I think a lot of the stuff I've seen that Sacred Bones does is like obviously like the the label like they kind of have like a thing where they put their you know symbol and like what the record title. It's like all pretty uh, con, uh, concise or cohesive. Uh, it's all cohesive. cohesive. That's the word. Um, it's all pretty cohesive. So all the records, no matter like what they sound like or what the band is, they'll at least have that kind of stamp on the right of the record. Um, a lot of them have the song titles on the front. Yeah. Yeah. Which is very cool. Very. This I, one doesn't. It's a, it's a, yeah. Mine does. Does oh, it? Oh, it does. Yeah. Where? Uh, it does. You, ca- you can't see it. It's, it's, yeah. Transparent. Yeah. Yeah. Oh shit. You're right. Put it in the light. Yeah. Look at that. It's very classic, very old country record kind of thing. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> yeah. I know. I know anytime I've like, scrolled through some of like the different carpenter represses and everything. I'm always really impressed with the way those look and uh, kind of the packaging of all those. Those are really cool. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't know a ton really about this label. I'm, I'm really not as familiar with this label as you guys are, but um, the few things I have like put my hands on with it has been, has had a lot of care put into it for sure. Uh, and that's, I know we, I can't remember if we talked about it maybe in the peasant or the summit episode, but uh, we talked about how this band definitely makes its choices based off of what they want to do. And they take it seriously. So like working with the labels that they wanted to, obviously sacred bones is a label they wanted to work with. It wasn't a label just going, Hey bud, we'll, we'll give you, we'll give you all of this. If you put out a record with us. Yeah. I'd love to know how it was, uh, how it occurred. Like, that kind of came to fruition, especially considering that they were just going to do it themselves. And then they were like, Oh yeah. Like this kind of stumbled in our laps. Like of course we'll do it with that label. (laughs) It seems like, uh, if they had done it the original way that they wanted to, that there would have had to have been a much larger gap between when the EPs came out and when the full length came out, if they were going to use the money from the EPs to pay for the full length, yeah, definitely. So I'm I'm glad it all worked out the way it did. Um, yeah, yeah. And at you know, at least it's a it's a uh, uh, it's a relationship that's you know progressed with you know the Emma collab and um, then you know obviously we have the new record coming out very very soon. Um, the artwork is great. I love it. I'm sure I'm missing a release or releases, but the artwork for this record in particular was done by. Uh, photographer Ellen Jane Rogers and Katie Burnett, uh, who are more they're contemporary like artists basically, which kind of stands out to me because it seems like most of the artwork that is used for you know Val records or releases are like shit that's been done like you know people are people are deaded in the ground, but you know their <laughs> all their artwork's behind and uh, you know Brian's been digging in the archives, but this is yeah it kind of stuck out to me like oh here's like people who are still kicking it and still making art and something about this is you know wanted to be used for the record and it it's very striking like it's, I, it's there's nothing like it it's it's different that's that's kind of the semblance with uh, the that artwork right this is a this is a different one it i mean immediate immediate look 
and it's completely different from really anything that came before it. Um, but I did they with some of their digital releases, did they use the metal etch or the wood etching as well? The metal etchings, did they use a version of that for uh Magus? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's like a yeah, yeah, is like it a, somebody face down like they're praying, something like, like that, or like their hand, yeah, it's either praying on the ground or like or maybe covering their, their head, the cover yeah. in their head, yeah, okay, yeah. It looks like a soldier because they have a metal helmet on. Right. Uh, our lineup, same as the last record. Mitch Wells on bass, Andy Gibbs on guitars, Matthew Thudium on guitars, Brian Funk vocals, and Josh Neon drums. This is uh, Josh's last record with the band. Um, he is like credited on Rhea Sylvia. I'm sure he worked on like the EPs as well. Um, but he did. It was kind of surprising because you know he didn't really he didn't really appear on any of the promotional stuff for the eps of the record so i think at some point whether during recording or or after recording in between the actual records themselves coming out uh josh was replaced by good old tyler coburn of yaucha and our wall and all the good stuff um we're big fans of tyler we, you know driving to Nashville for years and seeing Tyler perform in his various projects and stuff like that. So I, I remember when, when this happened, we we're like, what the fuck? Stoked. Like, yeah, yeah, that was crazy. But Narwhal I was played my Narwhal played in my bedroom once. Hell yeah. 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 And, uh, I don't, yeah, I think, I, I think I was there for that. I don't remember what year that was. I don't know. Fucking 1987. <laughs> I don't know. The only time I saw Narwhal was with you and it was, they opened for Touche Amore. Yeah, that was when they were like a fucking four piece. I think it was or, three that night. I saw them open for Touche Amore the year before that, and I think they were a four piece then. Or maybe they were just a three piece. I don't I don't remember. This uh, this came up uh because I was I was interviewing Kayon uh from Yaucha and also a new project, Wretched Blessing, which highly recommend checking that out. Uh Ray and Kayon making some really rad ass music, but uh, some of the first shows that you guys like took me to were like Yaucha shows in Nashville. Like one of the, I think my first show in Nashville was St. Vitus at the exit in, but then perhaps like not even that long after it, uh, there was a songs of descent release show at the stone Fox in Nashville. So it was like Yaucha and ramming speed. And I was like, blown away. I was like, I'd never been to a show like that before in my life. And then yeah. they played cafe Coco. It was like a very early cult yeah. leader show. Um, so yeah, There's, I mean, it was yeah. unreal. Like to think, like, oh man, that dude from like the shows that we go to, he's going to be playing in Thou now. <laughs> That's crazy. I will say, uh, I love Tyler. The drumming on this album is very catchy to me. Yes. It 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 reminds me of like in utero, like Dave Grohl drumming. Uh, I can see that. Not, and not that it's like you're not gonna he's not the busiest drummer playing like the craziest shit but i fucking some of these drum parts are just like seared in my brain especially like transcending dualities oh I fucking yeah love the drums on that song oh that's the one with the double kick break right like dead center of the song it like there's yeah. a break in like the double kick and it's just for that kind of part it's yeah that's really cool they have like been really kind of spoiled, I think, with some of these drummers, though. Like, I loved yeah. all of Terry's shit from like the fucking first few re releases. Josh is an amazing drummer, too. It's a different vibe, more straightforward vibe, but it's a driving kind of drummer. Like, yeah, it's, it serves the song. And then, of course, like Tyler is just, you know, what could be said about Tyler? He's just we fucking finally amazing. get to hear him on a Thou record. Yeah. I mean, well, we have, like, right. But no, but a, a first, like, proper full length. I'm very excited. Um, this is, yeah, Josh, there are definitely parts I noted, and we'll get into this a little bit more when we talk about the songs on the record too, but um, yeah, there were some, like, definitely some fills and stuff that he was doing where I was like, damn, dude, like, what are we doing here? Um, <laughs> we do have also a return appearance of the GOAT, Emily McWilliams, Silver Godling, frequent Thou collaborator. Uh, Emily has some amazing vocal parts on this album. Uh, like I said, we'll we'll get into that in just a moment. But I guess let's uh, get into the track list, beginning with the 10 minute opening track inward. Uh, like we kind of mentioned before, this was not like the first song written for the record, but 
perhaps this was like considered the song, maybe the uh, kind of uh, thematic base for the album. And it came maybe halfway through kind of writing the record. Um, I love this song. It's a great song. It sounds so fucking different than the first thou riff of the song is like seven minutes into the riff or yeah. into the, into that's, the song. Yep, that's true. That like really slow glacial riff. Uh, that's like seven minutes in and nothing before that really is like, oh, this is a thou. Like there's not any. It's more so like a slow build to yeah. that that riff. Um yeah, because it builds that kind of in my notes, I just got like this thing just keeps building and building like it is, uh, you know, building a I think you put it the best. It's like a it moves at a glacial pace and it's just building to that kind of peak, uh, which is that riff. Um, yeah, this is this one does open a little bit different than maybe even the prior two records or hell, maybe even the prior records in general. Um, yeah. This is this is a little bit different. Uh, it, it hooked me in. This is the I love how this record starts. I love it. Yeah, it's like got that kind of single guitar kind of opening, kind of warming you up. You know, it the picking. I feel like the picking with a lot of thou uh, records, or at least like Andy or Matthew, it's like very open sounding. It's like not they they're not necessarily palm muting very much but there's like a droning aspect of the the way they kind of play that style it's kind of jangly also there Mm -hmm. there are a lot of jangly sounding guitars like both like and maybe that's a little little bit of the southern coming out in it but it's like definitely i I don't want to say like banjo-esque but yeah you kind of have that open kind of droning note that is constantly throughout a lot of when you tune that low and you play kind of lighter strings you have to play your picking hand has to hit a little bit lighter. Right. So everything kind of has that kind of like sweeping through the string kind of motion to where it does feel like it's like you, you hit it the best kind of like a banjo string. Cause they're really light. It has that kind of looseness or that jangle to it. So yes, that is a big part of the thou sound that I've noticed is, I mean, these guys tune to tune lower than I honestly thought they could get. And then they tune even lower. <laughs> on just on standard instruments like it's it's yeah. wild you know these aren't baritone scale instruments or custom instruments they're all kind of standard scale length and it's it's wild because they don't and some of the live footage I've, i watched primarily for this record like they don't play very hard like they're not their hands are not just bashing the instruments it's very much a finesse to it and that adds a lot to their sound it's like oh they're making the amp and the pedals do all the work, which is fucking cool to me because it's like, oh, yeah, I got 120 watts, you know, ah, <laughs> why am I playing so hard, you know, <laughs> uh, fuck like and then it does help with those drone notes, too. Right. Because sometimes if you play too hard, it chokes the note and you want that note to have be as big and round as possible, like a pizza pie. You want it to be as big and round as possible, and you want it to be fulfilling, like a pizza pie. Hell yeah. (laughs) I, uh, what, no, but to to the, yeah, pizza worship. (laughs) To that, it's funny, because it's like, yeah, you would think that with all of this kind of openness and, like, the drone, you know, it, you would think, like, oh, that, there's no possible way to fit any other part of, like, layering, and, like, that should, you would think, fill out the space so well, but, like, you get into this track, there's like definitely some acoustic shit later in mm-hmm. there. There's like all of these James like finds a very good way to like place everything so well. And it, like I mentioned before, it doesn't feel like a fucking just, all right, here's just a wave of like all these different sounds coming at you. It doesn't feel like a mess. It feel like it's all, it all fits very nicely with each other. They aren't psyopus. That's for goddamn sure. <laughs> just like a panic attack. Um, <laughs> I will say there's a riff in the center of the song um, made me think of like some new wave of British heavy metal stuff. Um, Like if you, if you, if you paste it a little bit faster and it's just, it's real quick. It's kind of a thou thing. They'll play a riff and then they'll never play it again. It's like, Oh, well there it was. If you didn't hear it, like go back and listen to the record again, it's there. But there, 
Um, it's just this quick kind of minor, this minor chord tra- or um, transition. And it's like, oh, okay, that's a little bit more traditional kind of in sense. And I was like, oh, God, that sounds like, fuck, something off like a uh, like Lightning for the Nations or something, just a chord progression. I went, oh, that's just where my brain immediately went. And it was, it fits, it fits the song. It's not just like, oh, here's this throwaway thing. So it clearly shows that this band's songwriting is still very much rooted in if it works, if it makes sense. You know, don't just toss something in there because we want to throw a weird sound. It all still has to be, makes sense. It still, it all still has to make sense and it all still has to be cohesive. There's the riff. I don't know. Maybe it's like a, a third of the way in. That's like, da, 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 oh, yeah. da, 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 da. And I was like, the this course. doesn't, that doesn't sound like anything that's ever been in a, that is, does not fit in with <laughs> any other thou part ever. Yep. It could, sounds kind of like a different band, yeah. but it fits the song. There's a, uh, like it kind of like breaks up around like the four minute mark. I noted it's like kind of got like these higher, maybe dissonant chords and there's like some noisy feedback mixed in. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, they like, again, all of these different parts, like Swindle mentioned, there's like a million parts and like, not, I shouldn't say like too many parts, but like there's a, the songwriting is clearly getting better and they're finding ways to kind of like, like, I can't even believe we started over here a second ago. Now where the fuck, like where are, you know, but it like may it, it's smooth. It transitions very smooth. It's uh, I, I, what I do ultimately love about this track is it, it ends in typical thou fashion, right? Big fat fucking riff ends the song, uh, you know, doesn't necessarily fade out, but it plays out to a point. And then you're met with that nice uh, sequence into the next track, which I believe it's actually starts on this track, the way it's sequenced. You get to hear that like, that uh it's a drum machine you know for lack of a better word um but i love how this track ends just typical thou big fat riff that riff is so good that yeah. riff is very good the, those like guitar harmonies in the outro are like so yeah. fucking cool and it's like mixed in a way where you get like the higher part like right kind of up front and that lower part's still there but it's mixed just like right yeah. underneath it um jumps yeah. a little bit it's it's awesome yeah it does like fade very naturally kind of what i was mentioning before like every song on this record or at least most of them fade very naturally into the next song like this is like goes straight into that kind of ambient like industrial kind of like you know electronic drum part with my brother caliban and all i have to say i think brian is trying to get me to read the tempest and i like (laughs) never i've never had any interest in reading the tempest but maybe i do now (laughs) i'm like where is it my brother caliban uh, is a character Caliban's apparently a character in William Shakespeare's The Tempest. Uh, he's like a half man, half monster. Uh, that I think gets enslaved. I think I actually, I, I may not have read The Tempest, but we talked about it in school a little bit. And uh, I think there's like, if I'm remembering the playwright, I think there's like people on a ship, they crash like into a, an island and they like enslave. Caliban I think that's what happens Caliban's basically like yeah half man half monster half Dylan and he gets enslaved (laughs) and that's it and there's a couple I think there's like another at least one or two other like mentions of like things directly in the Tempest I've never read it so maybe there's like more in the lyrics that I'm just missing but as far as names are concerned that I things I could search up actually there's some references to the Tempest or maybe even a poem that kind of built off of the Tempest but uh you know, reminds me of the body, maybe even reminds me of some of the stuff that Andy has done. Um, Swindle, you mentioned Andy's supplicate. Yeah, that project there. Um, listen to supplicate. There's some stuff out. You should you should check yeah, it out. He just uh he just released something in March, I think. Right. So do you think that the ICP wrote their album Tempest based off the Shakespeare poem? <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> I just, I just need that confirmation. Um, this might, weirdly enough, this might actually be my favorite track on the record. Interesting. Um, Cause it is like, you know, it's two minutes long or whatever it is. And it's like, oh no, no, no. It's that's a minute that's, long. <laughs> yeah. There like, oh, it's a black metal track. 
Like as yeah. soon as I heard it, I was like, "How it's mixed?" I'm like, "This is some lo-fi back or black." Yeah, this is some lo-fi black metal shit. I was right? Ah, like, oh, there it is. That's what Brian was talking about. There's, yeah, I think there's definitely some full hell esque stuff on there too. Definitely some full hell kind of like stuff that you might see on some of their output. But yeah, I mean, it's got like the, I mean, I know it's like electronic kit, but there's yeah, like but some it's blasting. There. There's definitely some like black metal kind of guitar parts brian's yep. vocals on this have like kind of a strange distorted effect on it as well very jake bannon when we did the fucking magruder grind episode and uh on that album there's the one song that sounds completely different and that's the song that everybody likes yeah. that's what dylan just did with this fucking <laughs> song he's like my my favorite song on the album is the one that doesn't sound anything like the rest of the yeah, fucking yeah. <laughs> it's, it actually i said it might be i We'll get to actually. We'll get to it pretty quick don't, with what my actual favorite. Don't try track to is. retcon what you just said. <laughs> I'll say. I'm gonna, it. I'm gonna edit it where it's like, yes, favorite song. I'm <laughs> Dylan Adams. <laughs> this uh, again transitions into the next song very well. Um, the next song, like th- this, is an all time riff. This is a fucking all time thou <laughs> riff. This this is my favorite track on the record. Me too. Again, we talked about songs you could probably hand to somebody and be like, yes, this is the one. There's a couple on this. There's a couple on this like first half of the record that I would say are probably some all time thou tracks. But tr- oh, I mean, just kind of kicking things off with transcending dualities here. I mean, it's so fucking catchy. It's so melodic. Uh, even like the kind of the lead parts are like mm-hmm. amazing. Fucking hummable. You can yes. hum, you can hum these thou riffs. Yeah, I have, and I will continue to do so. Yeah, like, I do it all the time. That's right. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of this song certainly is um, a lot of the, it's like kind of that classic thing of like variations of the same riff. Yeah. But like, my God, when you have a riff like this. Yeah. Why, why <clears throat> you know. The, the different bouncing back and forth of the different minor chord parts in this song where it's different rhythmic foundations under it and and all of that is um really really catchy to me because it's probably the same chord progression um it's just the notes in between are a little bit different or they're played a little bit differently or the drums are patterned a little bit differently and it does feel like kind of feels like you're walking through a maze of like just yeah looping back and go this looks familiar but yet it's not this song is kind of pop song structured a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is kind of two verses, two choruses, and then like a bridge and then back to the verse a little bit. Yeah. I think a lot of, you know, maybe where some of these records we've noticed that we've talked about that there is like, maybe parts where you might play it once and you just like forget about it and just keep going even like lyrical stuff. I think there's like a lot of, like you said, kind of that pop structure thing where like you might return to a certain part or even a vocal phrase or something like that. I feel like maybe there's a little bit more of that that we haven't really seen out a lot of Val records. Like this one definitely has more of like traditional structures for whatever that means for this band. But I think, yeah, there's a little bit more like, Hey, this kind of sounds more like chorus part. We're gonna we're gonna have a chorus part here, I guess. They're um they're really good and great about the returning motif, kind of the returning part throughout the whole record. Um yeah. because there's a lot of parts on the record in different songs. And it was it was like this with Heathen as well, that sound like when you hear it on the later part of the album, you're like, Did I hear that the first part of the record? And you go back and it's it's not. It's just kind of in the same vein. So it makes you have that recall of like I would be interested to hear if that was intentional of like kind of how the human mind works, where you kind of like deja vu or you recall something in reality, it's just your brain putting images together to explain like, Oh yeah, this is all a very, these are things that you've seen before. It's just, we're putting them together to make you think you you've actually seen it before. So that trips me out about these, these, especially these last two records for sure. There's, there's definitely some songs on here. I think like through listening to this, you know, over the, over several years now, I was like, Oh, wasn't that part on this song? And it's like, no, 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 it's, it just feeds very naturally. And there's a, there's a a gap that we'll get to in a a minute that I'm like, Oh, that's perfect. The way they did this is perfect. But 
as far as this song goes, I mean, great riff. Uh, there's like a guitar break kind of like at the halfway mark that I, I think is amazing. Again, it, it's like, and maybe this is just the tuning or maybe some of the chords they're playing. It sounds like like that fucking octave pedal kind of sound to it. It's, it's the uh, tuning for yeah, sure. It's it's so good. There's like these like descending, that descending kind of like guitar lines that are playing in unison. Like such a good song. This fucking song is in drop E. Is it really? Uh, yes, it's drop E. <laughs> Which is low. It's so low. How is that possible? Uh, uh, so an eight string guitar has the lowest string is an F sharp. You're just tuning it down a step. Like it's it's low. And they're doing it again, traditional instruments, which is wild. It's it's a it's a bass, it's basically the same frequency as a standard bass E string. That's what you're at. Jeez. I don't really get much of the lyrics on this album. Uh, but I like the lyrics of this song. I think it's like um, kind of we shouldn't hold ourselves to binaries and gender and sexuality. It's all fluid and people shouldn't be shitty by like ad- making people adhere to the binary that we've come to grow up with or know. Uh, I, I don't remember what article it was, but I'm sure we all read it where someone, it was a review. Someone described that everything that is happening now and, and post 2018 with, um, with the, the different movements we've seen and the different protesting we've seen, it's just shit. Val's been talking about its entire career. And it's like, <laughs> huh? It's like, yeah, okay. Just be a good person. I know I, maybe I'm speaking for Dylan, but I think I definitely have, uh maybe more of a musical brain if that makes sense when it comes to a lot of this stuff heavy music extreme forms yeah. of music that's kind of what sticks out to me first but there are definitely lyrical moments on this record that like connect with me or even the phrasings just sounds like so powerful yeah. even if i maybe don't quite fully grasp them but i couldn't agree more with that sentiment so we go into another all-time fucking thou track baby the changeling prince um this is again such a hummable song and i feel like the way the intro is kind of set up and even just so unique i I Mm -hmm. when i was listening back to it it's like you can hear the guitar that's like almost gonna that's up front it's not playing anything it's kind of like warming up it's good there's like some feedback to it and there's like a guitar that's like sounds like it's a miles away actually playing before (laughs) the rest of the band just fucking floods in um so so cool um it's like it's kind of like uh when you know you see like an old cartoon and you are looking at the screen and there's like one object that's like clearly like sharper oh, yeah. than the rest yeah, of it. Right. It's kind of like I'm waiting. I'm like, I hear you're there. You're going to be playing soon, but like waiting for that object to be animated. I'm it's like, like uh, the trap door on Scooby-Doo. It's just yes. like a lighter yeah. color. So, yeah. you know, the trap it's door is going to open. You know, right. like obviously they had to like fucking pump out a bunch of fucking backgrounds because they're just, you know, trying to get these cartoons out. But like, yeah, I don't know. God like maybe damn kids stupid <laughs> analogy, but. Yeah, I was like, I'm like, there's definitely a fucking guitar that's like right, like right up in my face. It's just not playing anything. <laughs> and um, yeah, then it just fucking kicks in. I mean, it's got like, I, I maybe it's very easy for me again to just say like, oh, there's a, like some guitar, like a crowbar guitar or harmony parts the same on this thing. thing. That's just where my yeah. brain goes immediately. Uh, yeah. But man, it's, it's it's got a lot of details and layers on this track for sure. It's the the melodic motif throughout this whole song is one of my favorites. Um, yeah, that that whole and it's layered with an acoustic in there, um, and it's just it really fits the track a lot. It fits with the vibe, and you know I obviously we're definitely going to talk about the video because it's it's a fun fucking video. Um, you know I and I'll bring it up in a minute. I I, I truthfully didn't know. Um, <laughs> oh this, oh yeah. Uh, I've got to bring it up. Like sure. I, I honestly thought like, cause the bands are kind of similar in a weird way. And I was like, Oh, it's cause their first record came out around the same time as this too. I was like, okay. there's no way. So 
<laughs> well, yeah. So the video itself for the Changing Prince, I don't think this band had ever had a music video before. No, nope. by this point. Mm-hmm. So, and it's great. Uh, it's directed by Mitch and Brian. Uh, Mitch edited it, and you know, Mitch is like, you know, he's I big into that world. Like, he's done some stuff for the band. I think he even directed and filmed some stuff for you know the um, Emma collabs and everything. So. Uh, he was kind of like, you know, if you have a person in band who has like an appreciation and understanding of like filmmaking, then, you know, why not? Yeah. Um, But it's a really cool video. Uh, You know, it's like basically you're waiting outside and like they're going into a thou show only it's not thou. And it's like basically friends of the band, future members of the band um, that are kind of assumed the roles of thou. The members of thou are in attendance. If I'm not mistaken, they're kind of like, weirdly staring like almost they're, like lifelessly they're all, like wear, in, they're all wearing white polos yeah yeah to stand out from the audience more right because everybody like they're just goths like everybody's like very much <laughs> they look like a bunch of vampires just kind of w- 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 watching this band and so i there was a a promo photo released at some point where the fake band thou is all up front there's a white background where you could vaguely see brian and andy and like the the members of thou behind them kind of the thing and so i assume this is where you're about to come in i thought this was the band devil master the entire time (laughs) that's funny Um, you said that i thought you were making a joke and then you were like i legitimately (laughs) thought it was the band devil master the entire time devil master is this kind of traditional like weird version of hard rock meets like second wave black metal that Even relapse punk? is put I think up. They, they yeah. Got, like, oh yeah. There's some, yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. But it's very, that would be the type of band that would work with thou. It just, they kind of seem like they're in the same vein, same, have a lot of the same ethos. Um, and I, as soon as I saw that, I was like, Oh, that's very clearly that band and just haven't thought any different for years till you two guys were talking about it. It's like, wait a minute. I saw them recently on the decibel tour. I was like, yeah, no, nah, nah, that ain't that band. But it's like, <laughs> you're telling you know, me that's not that band. No, that's just a bunch of Draculas, man. (laughs) Dracula. (laughs) But yeah, so you have like basically friends and collaborators of the band that are featured as the band in this video. You have MJ Guider, who is like a multimedia kind of multi-instrumentalist artist. Um, I think I even checked out a record based on Andy's like recommendation. It was called Sour Cherry Bell from like a handful of years ago. Really cool. Uh, Definitely more in line with maybe like some shoegaze, maybe some sort of like maybe more like pop music, but great record. uh, Sour Cherry Bell. Definitely check that out. Uh, MJ Guider also uh, kind of appears on the uh, Tiny Desk as well. Mm -hmm. And I think has like perhaps been in the studio with Thou on recording as well. Uh, Might be on the inconsolable thing just because that Tiny Desk was they were performing songs from that record. Um, But uh, then you have Tyler who is the band's current drummer. Uh, You know, he has also appeared on the audio tree, the tiny desk. He's been on the Emma collabs, um, but hasn't actually appeared on a true full length yet. Then you have Casey Stafford also in this video who, uh, you know, has performed with Thou with the Emma collabs and audio tree and and was on the EP, the inconsolable EP. Um, Emily McWilliams, we know as a frequent collaborator with the band. I think there's another friend of the band who I'm not familiar with, but um, really cool video. There's also, I should mention, cameos by The Body and Lingua Ignota in the beginning of the video. The Body, is they're kind of like show go- concert goers. I think Lingua Ignota is like passing out flyers and then they're just going to like want to go. And yeah, so it's kind of fun to see other other like in the thou universe, like just hanging out in the video. <laughs> The video always, the beginning of it always made me think of like a municipal waste video. Just like, oh, <laughs> oh we're yeah. playing. Let's go. <laughs> like, and it's just different type of crazy, but, you know, it's in the same vein. It's, it's, it's all fun. I, again, you know, going back to Brian's sentiments about this wanting to be like a black metal record. This song has probably the weirdest like goth kind of vibe, not just with the video uh, tied in with it, but it's just. The note choices, uh, the melodic sensibility of it, the way it's layered, uh, chord choices, everything like that definitely has a spooky kind of vibe. 
Um, you know, I, it ties in with the imagery of the artwork to me. I feel like the song kind of really represents that uh, piece of art that's used. Um, I don't actually know what the title of that piece of art is, but I think it might actually be the Changeling Prince. I could be wrong. Uh, I feel like I read that at some point, um, but it just ties in with the whole arc of the record. And uh, I think we were all mutually in agreement. like this could have very well been someone's first time seeing or hearing this band because of a music video, right? You know, how, yeah. how many times have we all sat around, you know, drunk or not, and just watched videos on YouTube of just like, huh, this, this is connected to this band. Let's put it on, you know? Oh, how many parties did I try to kill by playing this music <laughs> video? You know, every one of them. <laughs> I hope, I hope they all. Yeah. But you're right. I think, uh, you know, bigger record been doing it a yep. while. Get a video. Looks great. Yep. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's definitely a possibility for sure. And I think this is maybe one of the most, especially the ending of this song. Oh, my God. That maybe one of the most like <laughs> dramatic, uh, emotional kind of parts of the record. It's like it just builds and builds, you know, into that line that Brian talks, you know, yep. like behind the mask, another mask, which apparently is a title of a song well or it's a, it's a title of another song from the inconsolable ep which right. i think it pops up a few times throughout the band's history well there i think brian is basically like writing on a, about a particular idea and just kind of kind of refines it and refines it and it pops up a few times i actually didn't mention this in the first episode when i talked about the hammer but uh he mentioned the hammer that song from in inconsolable those lyrics are from this old hardcore band i was in a few years back i was really into those lyrics and thought having people sing it like really clean pretty version would be cool so i think there's always just kind of like ah oh, that line's so cool let me just you know we even talked about it in the la last episode with he then you know in defiance of the sages ended up being another song title from you know it was like in the first track free will then yeah so i don't know cool uh it's such a small thing that I don't even know if it was intentional, but they also do that in this album. Uh, in uh, fuck, I can't. Sovereign Self Supremacy. Yes, oh, they mentioned yeah. Sovereign Self. Right in Supremacy, there's a lyric that uh, just says Sovereign Self, and that is a song on this album. It and is in fact the next song on this album. Hell yeah! yeah. Which uh, kind of alluding to what I was teasing earlier is like a part where I thought the beginning of this song, I wasn't like sure if like, was this part of the changeling Prince, but it has that motif, like where it's, it feeds in where I'm like, Oh, it's like in the same key or it's like kind of in that same style where it's like, Oh man, this is obviously like the most natural progression yeah. for this to go. Especially if we're just kind of making this one big piece, one big musical journey. This is like, it's a no-brainer. Like uh, this, it's it's so cool that this the way this song starts out and just you get lured in one. with Definitely. those those sultry vocals immediately, and then it's just gone, <laughs> never to return in that track again. Yeah, it's like thirty-five seconds, and then go. Oh, like it's just perfect. It's like it's kind of like when you watch think of a really nasty movie for the first time and you're like you're just lulled into this false sensibility and then it's just like hammer to the head Society. or something like that <laughs> okay <laughs> yes yeah there you go great reference you you think uh, you're you think you're going to a party and your dad's an ass like <laughs> <laughs> just a massive damn people fucking don't yeah watch uh what, what watch do they Society. call it they call it something else right Oh, I don't remember. I don't, oh, I, it's I been a while since I've remember. seen. Yeah. Uh, I, I watched it last year, I think. Yeah, it's a movie. It, uh, it's, it's, it's a, a fun, fun movie. Yeah, there was a lot of latex in that budget. <laughs> and they melted it all. Oh. Oof. Uh, this song is nasty sounding. Yeah. yeah, there are there are so many like notes in the riffs that are just a half step off. Dissonance, baby. The dissonance is real in this song for sure, but uh, it's so catchy. This is probably the second catchiest song on the album to me. 100%. It's very, yeah, it's got that earworm effect to it. Very, like, captivating. Um, 
And I think because the like ending of the last song was like so dramatic and then just to kind of even start kind of like somber and reserved and then just explode yeah. into this other like very heavy kind of melodic part. Uh, very, very effective. There's a part in this song too that like the band stops on a dime. Like they yes. just fucking stop. My God. And it's like all of the air gets sucked out of the room and then it kind of comes rushing back in with Brian on But Like I think this is kind of where the first time Brian comes into the song after you hear Emily and, and the parts, but he just kind of, bam, he just bursts in again. Uh, great, great part. Swindle loves a metal pause. I, yeah. He, yeah, fuck, I I'm not do. even making a joke. He <laughs> loves a metal pause. Yeah. Another, another thing that I love about this song is the fucking drone at yeah. the Go. end. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I, a, just, I just put another slab of thou heavy. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it feels like it's just on a, like a fucking continuous loop, uh, you know, and then eventually it, goes into the next song but yeah it really you kind of forget your name at a certain point <laughs> where you're at and you're like oh yeah like it, it just kind of you know fades into divine will that's just waking up in the morning post 30 years old man <laughs> that drone is what my brain is doing all the time just the <laughs> feedback and the the repetitive rhythmic pounding on the drums that's just what my like anxiety is doing constantly i like that you talked about the drums because again the way the thing that like ties both pieces together are josh the drums like you go from you know that droning part in sovereign self but then divine will it kind of carries over some of that like rhythmic pounding drum parts that josh is doing making it feel that much more one and and cohesive that is very much like a chant kind of thing going on that's very much like a a kind of an occult or satanic chant i'm not saying it is but um it's there's a track on danzig four called invocation it's the very last track and it's essentially him reciting something and it's been reversed but it's got some like organs and stuff under it and i my brain immediately went to that because that's a very kind of gothy album I was like, oh, shit, like that just triggered it immediately. It's like, all right, this is cool. This adds to that whole. This is a as a whole, the album is very. In the slew of all the thou records, this is a very dark fucking record. (laughs) So, yeah, it just it really ties the place together. Uh, I thought it was I don't know if it was purposeful and maybe it is just like Brian doing the thing uh, where he takes one side on one album and then takes the opposite side. But I thought it was interesting that there's a song on heathen literally called in defiance of sages. And it was about how like he thinks that we shouldn't take philosophers that seriously. And the lyrics of this are, we are the sages. Yeah. (laughs) There's a, there's a really great line and I don't know if I missed it. um, But I think it's in, uh, uh, earlier song tr- transcending dualities where it's like yeah like oh you know on heathen it's like yeah fuck you like live in the moment kind of thing whereas like transcending dualities like the in- the intellectual cares not for the approval of the fool I was like right <laughs> flip it right on its head i'm like damn all right cool uh this is a uh, you know for being like a minute and a half song you know it's, it's a cool segue track a really yeah it's a great like because it literally ends that first it's like a halfway mark essentially for the record and it kind of ends with like almost like air being pushed out like it just kind of ambient a little bit but uh yeah good good little piece there in the kingdom of meaning um again this is one of those tracks that we've kind of we've talked about on many of the episodes we've done to this band that just builds and builds and builds and it just just to reach a fever fucking pitch (laughs) <laughs> you know, just, just to reach, just to reach. The, it's like, oh, okay. Here's a better analogy. It's like going to the top of a uh, roller coaster, right? Straight down. You know, it's the Batman roller coaster at Six Flags. It just goes straight drop. The, the opening, the very opening of this track uh, reminded me of immortal, what immorality dictates. It uh, uh, kind of gave me like a underwater feel just like, yeah, a hundred percent. I kind of 
it felt like that the way that the, the reverb of the delay on that kind of first guitar, it felt like I was like in a, you know, that scene in uh, Zelda where you're like, you know, with the, the water people in the cave and it feels like yeah. you're, it feels cavernous, but it also feels very like aquatic too, for sure. Right. Like, it, very cool and then it also Water like, temple fucking sucks <laughs> <laughs> shit is hard um it's got like so you have that first guitar that kind of like all right here's a layer then it adds like a slightly more uh, like distorted kind of sounding guitar and then you know the band the full band kind of joins in on the i guess you'd call it maybe like the turnaround or whatever that right before it hit it restarts the riff like which they're very yeah. very very good at starting right. kind of mid riff maybe all of this song is like in three or six or very like variations but starting halfway through uh i think for a little bit it switches to three and for some reason sometimes three four like the w- when parts are written in three four it can be more fucking claustrophobic because you're like expecting another beat to be there, but it's only three beats and the riff like starts over almost immediately as soon as it starts. And the riff is like the riff in the middle is only like three notes and it's just dissonant. It's two, two notes are like right again, a half step off of each other. Yeah. And so it's like, da, 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 bah. <laughs> and it just keeps fucking repeating and it just goes like almost as soon as the riff ends it starts immediately over again like i was just like oh my god this is like this part of the album is just could like compressing my fucking head the anxiety of odd times and odd meters you're right it's because four four is natural time but the the odd meters of like three, four, five, four, seven, four, where everything stop or starts just, you know, immediately. Right. Uh, you know, yeah, you can swing in a way like a, you know, a six time signature swings a little bit differently, but those, those threes, fives and sevens, it's just really odd. And it, you're right. It adds to the dissonance and having odd times and meters and all that really adds to the whole, okay, I'm dying. This is it. This is just it. This is how it ends. Uh, nothing else is going to save me from this. Um, it's yeah. And having a band that's already as terrifying as this one kind of be able to throw in odd times. Fuck. Um, <laughs> it's just, it's like, okay, I need the, I need the setback. Cause that's how I listened to this record. I had to like, listen to it in chunks. I was like, that's a lot. This is and this band's, not necessarily the most pleasant band. So it's like, I, I have to spread <laughs> this mean? out a little bit. And like, I, I like, I, I'm okay with that. There's, there's a handful of records that I have to do that with. Uh, and these last couple of thou records have been like that. Um, but it's, it just adds to the chaos, the, the chaotic nature of it. And it's so, it adds to the vibe of it. I really enjoy it. Uh, and the fact that they, they're not playing an odd time the entire time. Like it's not every song is in some odd time. It's like, yeah, most of it's probably in four, six or three. But when yeah. they do bring in those different variations of three or something, it's like, oh, OK, this is something completely different. Impact. One other thing I wanted to mention to you about that, I, I, that really stuck out to me about this record was Josh's drum performance on this song. A lot of really yeah. cool fills and stuff. He's like, yes, he is certainly like more of a straight forward drummer holding down the foundation, but he gets to like kind of showcase a little bit of his chops on this song i thought i don't want to forget this this probably has my favorite part on the entire record on it it's less than three seconds long there's just clean vocals and then nothing else ever again it's like they just pop in and then they're gone it's like a couple times i think where it's like emily oh, is it and that yeah i think it ha- only happens like twice uh, okay but it's but it is quick where it's, it's like you, <laughs> you hope it comes back and it and it does where it's like yeah emily and brian kind of going back and forth uh, but it, yeah, it's kind of towards the end of the song. Yeah. Um, yeah. Really, really cool. After that, like really dissonant part at the end where y'all are talking about the guitar is like super fucking melodic right yeah. there near the yes. end. Mm-hmm. Yep. There's a great resolve on this track. Right. Then we start with a really 
filthy kind of intro to a song. Uh, greater invocation of disgust. Uh, we got Mitch with that filthy ass bass tone, oh, boys, kind of kicking things off. That is uh, that is a really low tuned instrument. Uh, <laughs> as a really really low tuned bass guitar, uh, and it's clean, although it sounds like it's not. <laughs> um, that's just strings. Hitting, hitting metal and that is an amp that's probably played pretty loud being pushed yeah. um that's yeah that's that might be the most audible he is on the entire catalog <laughs> just because like yeah there's points that stick out and everything but like this might be the most audible he is because he, it's so like just here it is <laughs> here's this here's the dry bass track right yeah and it fits yeah there's not much else uh, there's like some kind of I couldn't tell if maybe Matthew or Andy were like playing above the note or I'm sorry above the the nut. Um, yes, it's above the nut or below the bridge. Like, Correct. I heard yeah, it too. It's like very kind of like fluttery sounding. It kind of reminded yep. me of Nirvana's "Milk It." Yep. Which they have covered before, but it kind of was reminiscent of that. Like it had the same kind of vibe to it. On a com- I, this band in covers, I know, but. This on a completely separate note, I saw a show from like St. Vitus within the last. They covered a fucking Zayo track. That's fucking bonkers. Uh, and like the crowd went the fuck off when they played it. It's like Z- uh, Zayo or Zao, however it's pronounced, were like a. They were one of the early, really aggressive metalcore bands, like kind of in vain. They were one of the victory bands, I believe, but they were Christian adjacent at first, and then they they got away from that. But like, it's been it's pretty clear that Brian's probably a big fan of that early era metalcore with his, his love for coalesce and, and all of that. So like hearing that, I went, Oh yeah, that makes complete sense. And like, he fucking nailed it. Sorry. I just saw that was like, Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's cool. I didn't know that. I have to, I'll have to check that video out. Um, this track, the, the bass playing on this, the behind the nut or, you know, below the bridge, depending where it is, you can kind of get the same feel of it. It's that, you can also kind of do the same thing where if you mute all the strings, you can pick above where you're muting and it'll have the same kind of vibe to it. It's a very good um, kind of uh, noise vibe. I, you, you mentioned Nirvana. I went with, um, you know, you're right. That's immediately where my brain went because that's a lot of above the nut playing. First of all, this, this song is shorter. It's like five something, yeah, it, maybe it's, minutes. It's the, it's the quick one. Uh, it's it's also kind of pop song structured. Uh, the chorus riff is fucking catchy as shit. The groove is that that groove at like two and a half minutes in. I think that's it. Um, there's a solo in this song in a in a very kind of. thou in a very thou kind of way, or like yeah. maybe a grungy kind of way i think yeah there's there's a solo on here it's not the last solo we'll hear but there's nope, right definitely a solo on this song i was torn whether i thought it was a solo or a riff because they just keep playing the same thing and it's is it both of them it's not the most out front thing in the mix either it's it's subtle it's kind of lower in there so it feels like it's kind of gluing things together a little bit uh but i i thought it was just like those big kind of um those big whole step kind of punk rock bins. I thought it was those yeah. uh, with just a lot of feedback uh, on top of it. Cause it's a, it sounds like a big muff being pushed uh, maybe yeah. in that weird tone section where it's a little more bitey or a rat. Sorry, maybe a rat. Also the fucking vocal line leading up to that solo, uh, just like the music kind of stops and Brian says, we've got nothing but hatred. And then the fucking solo rip, the solo riff rips in. Fucking There's a dude, nasty dude. That's just Brian's. Give it to me, CC. <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's a vocal line. I, I I thought too. Like I was like laying on the floor, just like listen to it, and I'm like I had my headphones on. And it's like the uh, we will never understand the the like yeah hand, and it's like again maybe that claustrophobic like very isolating kind of thing. Love that. Love the love the mix of that. Um, I wondered too, having listened to this track, I kind of noted, I wonder if this is maybe one of the songs that potentially could have been built from like one of Matthew's songs that maybe like would have been on like Rhea, Rhea Sylvia. It it feels kind of like the the similar vibe, maybe just a little bit more like heavier than some of that stuff. But I guess, a little dirtier but, yeah. sounding for sure. 
Like it gave me that sort of like a similar vibe. We all we get like kind of little bits and pieces from the EPs, I think, and I, I that that's what the song kind of made me feel. The album's the sums of all the the parts. I actually thought that about the um, that last riff or the first riff for the last song. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, uh, in the uh, kingdom of meaning. Yeah, I I was like, oh, the tone of the guitar on this song sounds like Rhea Silvia. Moving ahead to elimination rhetoric, single guitar, Brian vocals, band kicks in mid riff. Uh, I it may not outwardly sound like it. Maybe just the way the vocals kind of came out. I got like black metal vibes, even though it's Abs- like yeah. slow as shit. It's like maybe the slowest song on the record. It gave me. Yeah, give me some some black metal vibes for sure. Obviously, going back to that quote from Brian yet again, um, it's definitely telling that. I, I think the quote was, you know, we wanted to do a. I thought we could do a black metal record, but to be kind of like put through the thou filter uh, of right. that, um, and like he's the record doesn't sound like that, but maybe it maybe it is, and maybe it's through the filter. Um, of that because his vocal performance on this record is pretty there like the way it's paced and how it's mixed and some of the choices he's doing with where the uh you know the the syllables and everything like it's it's there like he vocally it's there for sure um but then again maybe i'm just full of my own shit and i'm trying to make it out for what it's not i i, I don't know we know you're full of your own shit <laughs> not anymore <laughs> he had about nine coffees today. Uh, two, two, <laughs> two. They're really big. <laughs> the the coffee or the <laughs> the, the coffee. Yeah, yeah, the coffee. Yeah, the thing I also love about this the return, like that jangly kind of guitar uh, effects on this song for sure. Definitely all over it. Uh, we mentioned there was a solo in the last song. This song definitely, maybe like the most kind of proper solo maybe this band's ever yeah. done that i'm unless i'm forgetting something this this is a really interesting uh addition to the track and it has like this very interesting unique effect to it as well like if there's like some sort of uh guitar pedal that's being applied here that it, maybe i'm the word or the the pedal that i think it might be is escaping me but uh yeah really kind of interesting there's a modulation riff at the end of the song uh, with all the harmonics in it. That's that's the standout riff, maybe the standout riff on the whole track or the whole album for me. It's just very simple, very you know, kind of songwriting 101. You know, if you can't figure out what to do in a song, just move it up two frets. Um, you know, that's uh, and I, I heard it's it, like, oh, it's really fucking cool. And then the harmonics kick in. It's like, OK, this is kind of oh, a throwback to like, yeah, sweep kind of harmonic thing that they're doing yeah that's wild that's this kind of a throwback to i feel like that was something that was done on tyrant a little bit was that that's kind of a throwback to that at least in vibe to me um a little more traditional like kind of heavy metal in that part and i heard that and was all over it all about it the fucking riff to me was the one that's three minutes in the fucking crushing that to break down like three minutes into the, the, the one song. three and a half in yep yeah that's a Woo. good riff what a fucking what a banger hey man, also uh that does breakdowns sometimes yeah. yeah they do i think we might be hearing more of that coming up on the new one. <laughs> Ooh, what what uh, is you, you've heard it what are you talking no, about no no i said we might be not we have uh, uh, uh. uh i haven't heard shit <laughs> <laughs> also uh not I think the next to the last riff or something, uh, only on my headphones, I could hear like the strings being clacked, like the guitar sh- <laughs> strings. I could hear it's... them playing the strings. Uh, and I've always loved when I can hear it. But there is another. Um, they're fucking split. Um, uh, from 2018, I can't remember who it even is with. The song is uh, Death to the King and All His Loyal Servants. Pretty much yeah. that whole song, I can hear the strings being played. And it's, I could hear it like in my car uh, speakers. It's not even quiet. But those two songs by this band stand out 
for like just the no the weird noise when you're tuned to drop Z or whatever it actually I I can't even make heads or tails of what this track is played in because it's I've got some notes from an article but like it's fucking wild um but when you're I mean we said it in the bolt thrower episode like you could basically feel the string you could hear the strings just falling off the neck uh when you're playing it and it's like yep that's that adds to that like Jesus Christ there's even a song at the end of the album that like you that are literally like kind of scraping it up and and doing all sorts of shit on that I was like damn so I I imagined the exact words you're saying cuz you know we've talked about it with you know kill them all metallica or like records of that oh, yeah. you know ilk where yeah. it's like you, you can, can hear, hear all the fingers calluses. moving up and down yeah. the pick. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or up and down the strings. Again, that uh, another thing about the song, for sure, again, the kind of transitioning to the next part of the record, there's like the drum hit right at the end, and it kind of goes right into the noise and like kind of ambient nature of the law, which compels, which is, you Good know, a lot, of, a lot of feedback, a lot of noise, uh, vocals too, very reminiscent of the full of hell and body type of stuff that we've, been kind of talking about earlier kind of sparse drums and there's like even like a that effect that almost kind of sounds like bugs you know what i mean like that kind of similar kind of no, white noisy <laughs> kind of sound effect um but it even has like some kind of like guitar like delayed kind of jangly guitar picking underneath it as well um the thing that this song reminded me of although this is probably a little this is more musical to me uh, there is a it's the title track of Weekend Nachos Worthless uh, from like 2011. And there is just like a three or four minute straight like feedback like part like it's just noise before it goes back into the like rest of the record. But yeah, definitely a little bit more musical here, I think, instead of just like in your face feedback. Yeah, this kind of reminded me of. Man, the Ramparts by Botch. Like uh, before. Before uh, that may be the last song on We Are the Romans, uh, but before it gets into like the heavy shit, there is like kind of a ambient, more ambient part. And it reminds me of that. Uh, yeah. And then it basically just fades out. And then we start the last song of the record, Supremacy. The hate uh, cover. You can't. <laughs> we got uh, a little like barely any feedback you have barely like a second to like even kind of get accustomed to what's going on before it just fucking hits you right in the chops immediately like it just comes right at you this is the riff that reminds me of something that would be on Rio Silvio. yeah i also love the lead guitar tone on this track too like i don't there's there's some really cool like little layers guitar wise on this there's probably more of there and that may be the the references to the Rhea Sylvia stuff is that there's definitely more grunge on this album than at least to my caveman ears than any of the albums before it, at least to my to my knowledge, because like they're really bringing that out on this one for sure. Like, yeah, there was definite influence on a lot of those other records as well. I mean, it's hard not to say, you know, Super Unknown's Fourth of July didn't influence a whole lot of that stuff. Right. Or, or or anything like that, Allison Chains, you, you you name it. But this album in particular has a lot of the kind of ingredients and you know spices and seasonings and all that stuff from like more of their grunge area. And that may be because of all the EPs they did preceding this record, right? That stuff was still really fresh, and it's like, oh, I could add a little bit here, add some there. Let's add this type of instrumentation there. But like this definitely has more of that kind of early 90s heavy music kind of feel to it. I also think it's a very good climax to the record. We've been kind of talking about a slow build and, you know, while all of the songs are like, you know, very heavy and melodic in their own right, I think this is kind of where, I don't know why my brain's like going to uh, the Beatles currently, uh, but the day in the life, you know, that part where it just kind of like, just goes yeah, yeah. off the fucking rails with like all the orchestration right. stuff. I feel like there's a little bit of that here where there is just like a lot of layers happening and it does feel like it's very chaotic and just like all coming at you at once. I mean, the feedback in the drums, um, right. The, it, I, maybe I'm talking more towards the end of the song specifically. There's like, 
some stuff that, because it's kind of just like a wall of sound at a certain point. I was trying to like listen to it and I'm like, there's definitely somebody talking or either that or yes. I'm going yes. fucking nuts. But I was there, like, no, I, there is. It, yeah. Uh, it's got to be a sample. And I, I don't know what they're saying, yeah. but I felt like I kept hearing the word thou. And I was like, on their website, they have like a collection of bad reviews of like either albums or shows. And I was just wondering if they got like some computer Ooh, to man. read like the reviews, like a Mr. Speak and spell s- like sampled that at the end. But I was like, I also <laughs> definitely heard the speaking at the end of the album. I w- I went back like several times just I'm like, am I fucking because some of the you know, there's a lot of layers here. There's a lot of like little guitar parts. I'm like, maybe I'm like, fuck. But then when it kind of cleans up a little bit at the end, you definitely hear it for like a split second. I'm like, okay, there's definitely somebody uh, talking at this point. But uh, before we get to the, the end of it, Dylan, there's some fucking guitar harmonies on this. I don't know if maybe you caught it and maybe what did it make you think of? Uh, you know, I, I caught it, but it was, it immediately it hit me. It was just like, oh, that's kind of, that's a fresh thing. My brain didn't go anywhere with it. And usually my brain will hit something, catch it immediately on. But it was just like, oh, that wasn't used a lot on the record. Here we get it. Finally, tell into the record, like it's cascading off into the sunset. Did it make you think of anything? Did it make you think? Oh, that's, that's funny. I just uh, I didn't wear this on purpose, but there were like definitely Uh some very I swear to God, uh, some very like dissonant, (laughs) atonal kind of harmonies that reminded me of like some death, some death era stuff. I doubt that's what fifths. I doubt that's what influenced it, but it just made me think. Nah, I don't know. They don't. And that's fine. Maybe, you know, there's somewhere else it draws from, but it, it made me think of like death for sure. But yeah, very climactic ending. Very like you know kind of wall of sound there's like you know just a descending drone and kind of noise i think there's it almost even sounds like a a dial tone at a certain point like a phone almost like hanging yeah. up or something and it just kind of ends and that's you know the there's record. a thing about feedback that and i might be the only person or one of you guys that thinks this like when you hear a sound repeatedly constantly for a period of time you start to hear other things in it like if you hear someone wrap their hand on the table and it's the same tone every single time, you're going to hear different things from it each time, right? It's like after a while, it's like, oh, I can hear this type of sound from it and this type of sound. After feedback, like to what you're saying, kind of sounds like a dial tone. You can get different tonalities from it. It is very much a, it's probably just how our brains process that type of signal or, or a repeated signal or anything like that. Um, I'm sure I'm getting really in the weeds of some sort of like, you know, smooth brain person on, when it comes to stuff like this. But it's like I hear it from this band and it's like, OK, they're definitely using it in the most musical way you could possibly use it in this track. And it's like, ah, fair game. I'll take it. Yeah. Uh, clocking in at about an hour 16 um, hour and 58. Yeah, oh yeah, I kind of made a typo. I um, legitimately thought I was going to pull myself off the floor. I was like, I, I've had a stroke. Yeah, it was. I, I, yeah, I think I was just trying to do notes and I somehow like, Ooh, fucking, like got real worried there for me. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, all to say, you know, we kind of complete this trilogy with Summit and Heathen and Magus. Um, do you have any final thoughts about the record and, you know, like, getting thus far like this is currently the latest record we've gotten a few singles we'll get into that in just a moment but um wh- what are your what are your thoughts about the record what are you thought like how does it compare to some of maybe the other releases I, obviously we've kind of gone in but like maybe to sum it up for folks how do you feel sum on the other up. side sum it up sum it up <laughs> all right uh, i i had uh at when we did this at Heathen, when we were like, uh, what did you think of the record? I was like, maybe I'll listen to this more than Magus, because uh, I don't listen to this that much. And after listening to Magus, I, Magus is, I just, that, this, that album is catchier than Heathen. And although, like, maybe the lyrical concepts of Heathen, I understand more, and I can, like, 
take more from the lyrics of that album. I just think the music of Magus is just so much catchier and gets stuck in my head like like no other Thou album, at least. I uh I really fucking love this album. I couldn't agree with you more. I think kind of similar to our cattle decapitation episode as well, where I don't think necessarily cattle decapitation has had a bad record per se, but I think there has definitely been a clear progression. And so like, you know, being four parts into this series, I think this is probably the best shit they put out to date. Like, like you said, uh, I mean, it's got all of the, uh, character and the catchiness and it's heavy and yeah while i may not connect with the lyrics as much maybe they're just you know a heathen was certainly more accessible in that way there are definitely lines in here that stick out to me i mean there, there's stuff that you know even just kind of looking at the lyric sheet where i was like what is this line from it's not even on a li- it's like uh the the lyric sheet itself has a thing where it'll give you all of the the words from a particular song and then there's like a line like just under like a quote. I mean, there's stuff in here from, you know, like I, I mentioned like the Tempest or there's a, uh, like a poem called Caliban upon set set to again. Fuck. I don't know. Um, that's like a, from like a poem published in like 1864 about the, you know, the play or uh, like kind of building off the play. There's some fantasy novels that are alluded to. Uh, it's called like the white luck warrior by R. Scott uh, Baker, the, like stuff I've never like. Brian clearly is like a reader, uh, like, and I think he was clearly influenced by some of the themes of this book. Where it's like, I got to put this in here. I don't exactly know how they tie in, but all to say, it's cool to see a band just get better and better with each release and end up here with like the aesthetic and the packaging and the song work. The songwriting is just like second to none. It's yeah, I, I truly think this is, as far as we are recording this record, we're talking about this record, <laughs> this is some of the best shit that they've put out to date, and that's awesome. This is the most challenging Thou record I've had to listen to. It's it's dense. Um, there's just so much to me that's going on in it. Um, and sometimes I felt like maybe the direction of it was to make it less accessible uh in reflection to heathen being accessible um so this is i still say it i think heathen and summit could fight for number one for me this is one i'm definitely gonna have to spend more time with um it's it's really dense it's a challenging record and that's not a slight on the album uh you know neurosis has stuff that is very hard to to sit through and, and get through um, but it was, it's worth the listen there. I know more about it now listening to it as much as I have over the last couple of weeks, uh, than I did before, but it's still going to take some time for this one to really set in for me. Cause it's, it's a lot like I do my one full on kind of complaint is that I don't think the sequencing is meant for someone like me. I need that breath when it comes to music like this, I need that kind of here's to take a breath. Here's to take a breath kind of thing. I I need that. And the way the sequencing on this is, is like, I I think there's two tracks, two really long tracks, like right next to each other. And then it kind of sequences out for like a minute. And then it's on to two other really long tracks. It's like, okay, um, this one to me would probably come. If I to current date, uh, I would go, Summit, Heathen, kind of in the top spot for me. Then I would go Tyrant, um, and then I would go Peasant, and then I would have uh, Magus kind of at the bottom for me. Um, yeah. Wow. <laughs> hey, uh, Summit, Summit really got me hard. Like it, it, like when I heard it, it was just like, "Fuck, this is this is this is the thing." It's the blast beats, man. It just did it. Yeah. It's hard, it, like, yeah, thinking about how they would rank. I may go back, like, reverse chronological, I think. Magus, even. But then, I mean, I don't know. I think I kind of mentioned it in the Summit thing. I, I think I have, like, a 
maybe a newfound appreciation for like listening to that record. Um, you know, the first two records are great. I think the, you know, I could, they're probably towards the end of the list for sure. But like, I would say that, yeah, Magus, Ethan close second summit. Yeah. Probably like reverse chronological. I, th- I think there's true, like a true progression there personally. It's, it's not to even say that I dislike the record. It's just a very, it's, it is a record that you have to spend the time with for sure. And that's the, that's the goal of this band too, is these aren't records. You just go, you know, I'm going to put this on like, you know, the minor threat collection. I can hear it. I know the songs, like I'm going to go through it. This is one you really have to sit and go, fuck, I need to dedicate the time. Don't look at your phone. Don't look at anything. Spend the time, listen to it, do the actual honed in listen. And with this record, it's like, oh man, there is just, again, so many dense layers to this that you go, what am I hearing? What's going on? Like it's, um, you know, obviously the, the use, it seems like the use of the drone is bigger on this record than it was on heathen, uh, at least to my ears. And, and maybe that's it. Maybe I, maybe that's the big thing for me is like, I'm a very much a just where's the riff kind of guy when it comes to a lot of this music. Uh, there's been a lot of bands I've said that about, and it takes a minute for me to kind of come back to it and go, okay, it, I, I was being a little too harsh with it. Uh, but this one is, I need some more time with it for sure. All to say, this is leading up to the new record, Umbilical, which will be released May 31st through Sacred Bones Records. We got two singles already. I Feel Nothing When You Cry, Unbidden Guest. Uh, they are much faster paced. They are sonically very different from what we just heard. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like kind of a maybe more of a, like a Wallace sound. It's very abrasive kind of sounding yes, it is. so far. And I will say these two songs are... I don't know if it, it's a part of the record, but they're going to end up on the seven inch. And, you know, so you have like, if you pre-order the record, you get the, you know, the 12 inch vinyl, but then you also have the seven inch that has these two songs on it. So, you know, I'm sure there will be a similarity between all of the songs, but, you know, I, as far as what I've heard so far, uh, yeah, it's, you know, like more of a, there's a shorter and like a kind of a punk, you know, aspect to it, which it has always been kind of there, but this is like, a lot faster than what we've heard on a lot of this is kind of the, the intentional direction of like, Hey, let's kind of, let's do a punk record. I was going to ask, I don't know who produced it or mixed and mastered it. Is it, is it the same team? Cause it's so different sounding. I mean, definitely was Witten. I assume it's James. I would presume it's pro you're right. You guys are probably right. It's probably the same team, but the mastering may be the question, right? Because that's a very, it's it is it's very like a chaotic wall of sound on there it's almost like uh maybe some of those early like amphetamine reptile records or anything like that just those fucking chaotic and noisy sounding things like um you know after hearing you know magus and heathen where brian's very up front in the mix like you can hear him you can almost hear him spitting on the mic it's it's so clear and he's pulled back again kind of going a little bit a little bit more necro with it like pulling them down in the mix to where it's kind of another instrument so looking forward to hearing this and uh digging into it a little bit yeah we will be doing a part five <laughs> we may have some we may have some very special guests with us so i'm not sure when exactly that will come out it, uh but stay tuned there Maybe will a be review. part five i don't know there will be a review dylan's there, gonna do a review yep. of this record um but yeah maybe something special coming your way so stay tuned follow us for that and uh yeah see you very soon with part five all right we've reached that part of the episode where we like to recommend some things we've been listening to some things we've been checking out um sometimes you need to take a breather you know once you get through a little bit of that so i've been listening to uh kind of an it's it's a favorite of mine from the past couple years uh this is a band called the berries uh, it's kind of the project by Matt Barry. Uh, this is, I believe, a Seattle-based artist, or they were based in Seattle, moved to L.A. Um, this record came out in 2022. It's called High Flying Man. It's out on Run for Cover Records. It's the third record by the band. I think Matt was in uh, Happy Diving, Big Bite. Uh, maybe some people who played on this record also have some ties to Regional Justice Center. Um, 
Matt was also like briefly a touring member of Angel Dust and maybe a few other projects, but this is his band. Uh, I love this record. It's got great songwriting, uh, great riffs. There's like a lot of like kind of classic rock kind of vibes to it. Like I almost hear like maybe even like Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers or stuff like that. But, you know, definitely maybe a more modernized, maybe indie version of that. If, if you know, indie, whatever. Um, but there's also some kind of somber tracks, a really fun record. High Flying Man, uh, it's out on Run for Cover Records, so check it out. My only rec is uh, at the end of April, the power violence band AC, ACDC released the album Goat, or G-O-A-T, uh, on Prosthetic Records. It is, it's, a, it's a long one for power violence. <laughs> it's like 23, 23 and a half minutes, God damn. Uh, but it's... It's fast and heavy. It's uh, their wall. It's, <laughs> what the, what's the abbreviated thing? It's like Antichrist Demon Core. Demon Core. That's it. Right, yeah. right. Great name. Right. Great fucking name. Yeah. Check that out if you're into fast hardcore. You know, everybody needs a bit of a palate cleanser from uh, after doing just digging in the just trenches with Thou for a while, right? You know, we went the nom and came back. Um but uh, I went with something really dense, uh, <laughs> maybe in a different a different facet. Uh, I'm a big fan of some technical death metal bands, and the band Wormed from uh, South America uh, released their first new single in like God, like eight years. Um, and it is I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of this because it's they're into aliens and shit. Um, it's called Automaton Vertileg, Vert- Vertilau. Uh, it's it's on there. We're going to link the track at some point, um, but it's going to be on their new album called uh, Omegon, O-M-E-G-O-N. Uh, and again, sounds like some Terminator 2 shit with the description of what the album's about. I'm stoked on it. It's fast. It's crazy. It's uh, sounds like a bunch of crickets, um, which I'm always excited for. But like, Check that shit out. It's going to be out on Season of the Mist Records on July 5th of this year. So looking forward to that. I will definitely attempt to review that when I can. Uh, And my second rec is an older one. Um, I recently went to the Chaos and Carnage tour uh, a couple weeks ago. And uh, that was the night that Tennessee got plagued by tornadoes. So the entire time I thought I was going to die. So I decided to put on a record that that makes me feel like... uh, you know, nothing good is going to happen. And that's Slipknot's Iowa. Uh, it's not pleasant. It's noisy. It's nasty sounding. It makes you think it makes you feel it makes you wonder what was so wrong with being a Generation X person. Um, you know, great record opens up with blast beats. Um, you know, people equal shit. Heretic Anthem, My Plague, all those tracks. Great album. If you haven't listened to it a while, listen to it again. Well, check it all out. It's what we've been listening to as of late. You can always follow us for any updates on this show at Riff Worship Pod, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, we also have an email. If you'd like to send us some questions, send, uh, send them, tell us what we're fucking up. Tell us what we're doing right. Uh, it's our Gmail, riffworshippod at gmail.com. Uh, you can also check out our playlists that are curated weekly or just regularly. Uh, Spotify, you got uh, Riffs on Repeat, Apple Music that Dylan runs. You got Hits from the Crypt, Dylan mentioned. He does reviews every week. There will be a new release that comes out, whether it's in the, the day of or like within the next few weeks. Uh, reviews from the Dillbozers Den is a great place to kind of stay up to date on new music and uh, get in the tap with that bald dome. See what's running around up there. He's got a lot of great <laughs> ideas. There's, there's, and there's a whole lot of mush up there. Knows what he's talking about. So pay attention to that. Um, this has been great. We still have one more piece of this puzzle. Umbilical is going to be coming out May 31st through Sacred Bones Records. And I think uh, you're going to be uh, wanting to tune into that. Just yeah. saying. So we'll see you soon with that. Until then, for me, for Swindle, for Dylan, this has been Riff Worship. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.